Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. God's love is all-encompassing. If you hook up with Jesus Christ, you will win. Your life will turn around. He's a God of 360. He never fails. He's the God of love, and love never fails. Hi, I'm Michelle Michalakis, and I'm going to speak today about, the, um, about embracing your assignment in life and with God. And I think it's a great subject, and I have some bullet points I want you to follow along with. And get your pen and paper, because we're going to take a ride here. We've got a lot to cover in a short time. But I'm going to talk about an assignment. Assignment is basically giving someone a particular job or a task for a particular person. And God gives us those. It's just that a lot of people can't recognize what they are. They have a hard time finding what they are. So a calling of God is virtually a divine appointment, and everybody has one. And let's look at Job 23 and 14. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. That word appointed or performed means shalom, means he completes it and he fulfills the thing that is appointed for me. That God has a special thing, a special job for you that he's going to complete in you. You see, it's God doing it, and we are basically just the vessels. So let's look at... Um, Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So it's not us, it's God in us. Most people find it very difficult to find their calling within the body, that, that very thing that they're called to do. And there's nothing more important than finding that place that you are called to in God. And in my own life, I tried many, many things. I, I, have, I have done so many things. I didn't have the luxury of of knowing exactly right off the bat what I was tried, what I what I was called to do, I've watched other people that have uh, say someone is called to preach. Well, in the beginning, I I felt a lot of things, but didn't really know for sure. As I watched other people just embrace their callings, and and I think I can identify today with a lot of people uh, that are out there, but. I must say, not everyone's called to preach, but we are all called to teach and to witness the gospel. So how then do we do it? How do we find that? Luke 15 and 8, and 8 through 9. This reminds me of how it happens. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and diligently seek till she finds it? And when she hath found it, she called her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace that I have lost. It's kind of what it's like. It's kind of searching, a searching out to find that calling that you have in God. It's a process, and many, many times uh, it's a journey uh, for people to find that. But you know something? If you want to find it, you can find it. I tried many things. I, I wanted to learn. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to grow in God. So what did I do? I've done everything from, I sold insurance, cemetery property. I went 10 years to college. I've worked various jobs. I worked at the packing house. I, I tried different businesses. I brokered, re I, I, uh, I delved in real estate. I brokered scrap. I, I designed a line of novelty caps. I, I took an EMT course, a master gardener course, but it was a journey. But along that journey, I collected a ton of experience. So did Abraham really know where he was going in all of it? Well, let me show you because God gave him a promise. It was a walk of faith, and this is a walk of faith. Abraham, or <laughs> Hebrew 8, uh, 11 and 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have after received for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. I didn't know where I was going in life really either, but I knew that I wanted to do something significant for God, and I got to ask you today, do you? You know what? You hold on and you hold out because I'm hoping through this message that this is going to minister to somebody that you're going to rejoice at the end of it and get an, an aha moment, a rhema moment that says, hey, I've got an inkling. I've got an idea what I'm called to do. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Trust me, God knows where you're going. Even if you don't know where you're going, he knows where you're going. So why would God give you an assignment? He gave you an assignment so you would have a purpose in him. So is it important to God that you have a purpose? One thing that Jesus asked the disciples to pray about, and one thing only, and it was this. Luke 10 and 2, he said, Therefore said he unto them, 
The harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send labors into the harvest. I guarantee you, everything you do, or everything you're called to do, is going to win the most souls. It's, it's got to be, it's all about being fruitful for the kingdom. So what does a purpose do for you concerning the kingdom? Jeremiah 29 and 11, what did God say uh, through Jeremiah? He says, I know the thoughts that I think for you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. God wants to give you an expected end. He wants to give you a great ending. God is a God of great endings. I believe that. God instituted employment and work all the way from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And why wouldn't God want you to work for Him? Because, you know, really to work for Him a purpose is a gift from God. You know, uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and 13, 14, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labors. It is the gift of God. God attends to every detail of our calling. Nobody can add to it. It's perfect. Whatever he calls you to do, I guarantee you, it's custom fit for you. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it that men should fear before him. Is there, better, is there anything better in life than to have a God-ordained calling and purpose in life, something eternal, a gift from God? Ecclesiastes 3.22, Solomon had all the answers. Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion, that's his lot. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? You're not going to see what's coming after you. You are going to literally uh, give a baton to someone else that this thing is cyclic. Your life is cyclic, the work of God is cyclic, and someday... But in our lifetime, in the scheme of our lifetime, the dash is put on the monument of, uh, you know, of your grave someday. You know, what we do in that short space of time is so critical. There's going to be five bullet points here that I'm going to run through. The first one is seasons and timings. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 2. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. See, everything's cyclic, everything. But God works in seasons in our life. And there is what's called in the Greek the chronos. That's the, the ticking of the clock, the tick, 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 tick. That is the horizontal measure of time. And then we have a vertical measure of time that's heavenly. It's called the kairos dimension of time. And that is God's appointed time, the opportune time in our life where God causes everything to come together and there's a crescendo at the end of it and that promises that promises literally birthed and manifested you that you understand it. I look at, I remember when I worked for uh, uh, NICC, you know, I worked for five years in a particular office and for the last three I asked the Lord that I, I just kept, you know, if there's such a thing as driving God crazy, I think I did it. Because every day I'd be saying, God, I only want to work for you. I only want to work for you. I only want to work for you. And one day at the end of that five years, I, my position was a grant position. And I looked down over my boss's back at the bottom of that email. And it virtually said I lost, that I lost my job because the grant got discontinued. My boss was so upset. I said to him, listen, I didn't know how to say it to him. But I said, listen, you don't feel sorry for me. I said, I'm a survivor. I, I, I'll get along just fine. You know, I will. But he didn't know that months before I got let off my job that God had set a deal, a, a, a financially secured me so that when my position was cut, I could make it. You see, that's the hand of God directing my life. And you know what? I haven't worked for anyone since. And I don't believe, I believe till the day I die I'm going to be working for Jesus. I do, and that is my desire. But you know, was I scared? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But I was more scared. I was excited. Let's look at King David. He went through many seasons in his life before he actually became king. First, he was anointed, right? Then he played in Saul's court. He played the harp. Then he slew uh, Goliath. Then Saul hated him. And then David spent many, many years uh, building up to the kingship. But there actually came the day when the, when the Kronos intersected with the Kairos, and there was a crescendo of a birthing of his promise, and he became the king. A wise old woman once told me, she said, it's not important where you go, Michelle. What's important is when. Because if, you, if, if when is right, then that means God has prepared you and he can take you anywhere. Where is not important, it's when.
timing with God is everything, my friend. Let's look at the life of Joseph. He spent many years either in charge of a dungeon or literally in the dungeon. If anybody knew what a prisoner was to be like or how to take care of a prisoner, it was him. So there came a day when it all come together, though, and in one swoop of time, hastily, he was brought out of that dungeon and he became governor of Egypt. Who would have thought? But you know what? There are people out there that you're working a regular job and you know, you're thinking, this is all I'm going to ever do. This is my portion in life. This is my lot. Of, well, I'll never do anything great. Baloney. Let me tell you, God can do anything in your life. This may just be a testing if you're going to embrace your promise. You've got to abide where you're at and do the best you can do before God's going to promote you on to the next level. Okay? So embrace your promise. I don't care if you're a garbage man picking up garbage. I don't care if you're a school teacher and want to do something for God. You don't know when God will lead you out of there and you'll lead a great nonprofit or you'll be a preacher of the gospel hopping the globe. You don't know what God will do for you. And to God, small things are big too. It may be visiting nursing homes. It may be, you know, getting up in front of your church doing specials. Whatever you do for God is important because everything to do with God is important. And everything to do with God is eternal. So let's look at the next bullet I want is desire. Let's look at Philippians 2.13. The Bible says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Let's look at that, he, uh, let's look at that Greek word will. It means pressing on to action. It means purpose. It means what pleases God and what he has ordained. It's his desire, his purpose, Let's look up the word to do. It means to move in a circle. So let's put it all together. His desire in your life keeps moving forward. It's his desire that propels us forward in ministry. Now what do we mean? It's his desire in you. The things you like to do, they're not your things. They were planted there by God. And you go, well, you know, I like to play a guitar. I like to, no. It's because God put that there, just like he did David. But see, ultimately, we are to have a fruitful end. So, how do we know what God's desires are in our life? It will be the things you like. I remember when I went to college, you know, and I thought about many times, what am I going to be? And I, I thought, well, the best thing to be is where you make money. No, it wasn't. You need to follow your heart. Because it's in your heart, his desires, that are going to show you where you're going to go. And then another thing, a little sidebar, start listening to your prayers. And that will tell you where you're going. Because you will be praying his desires out. And it's powerful because it will tell you where you're going to go. Okay? So I look at my own life and I followed the arts. I followed communication. I followed science. I followed administration. And believe it or not, I use every one of them today. You know, I, everything from commercial art to photography. And I can show you, go right down the line, and how all those things today I use for the kingdom, unbeknownst to me. I just followed my heart. I followed my desires, and they were God's desires. You know, we also have treasures from Egypt. You know, the children of Israel borrowed from the Egyptians, okay, right before they went through the Red Sea. And God said, go borrow from them. So what did God do with that? He took and he built the temple. And we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Things like jobs and classes and skills we gathered along before we ever come to God. Those are treasures of Egypt. You know, I worked in the recycling arena. I ran, I ran my father's scale. I, I worked as a painter one summer. I, I uh, op, you know, I, I worked in the packing house. I gained some knife skills. But, and then there's hobbies, uh, hobbies and giftings we enjoy. Everybody's got them. You know, Beethoven had one. He, he, was, he was deaf. I think he was even, uh, might have been mute. But he was the great, one of the greatest composers of all time because he took that one thing that makes it easy when you got one thing, and you can become great through one thing. As long as you got something from God and everybody got it, you can become great. It may be playing the guitar. It may be quilting. It may be, it may be cooking. It may be woodworking. But all those things are giftings to use for God. Think about it. Start brainstorming. Well, how can I use this for God? And then move towards that goal. So... God gave him instruction. You know, when they built the temple, he pretty much said, get this guy and this guy and this guy. Well, it's the same in the body of Christ. Everybody, there are craftsmen amongst us. There are scholars amongst us, and it all fits jointly in the body. Now, let's, there's one other thing. 
There are people groups that you like to work with. Some people like to work with kids. Some people like to work with elderly. I hung out a lot with my grandma when I was a kid. I like elderly people. I like working with them. What about ethnic groups? People like that usually become missionaries. What, what about uh, the disabled, the deaf, on and on? That's a particular group. That's a drawing from the Holy Ghost to move in that direction. Okay? David ended up in the palace with Saul because God gave him the abilities to play the harp. If he couldn't have played the harp, he'd have never played before Saul. He would have never learned the courtly uh, ways of, of, of the palace if he wouldn't have learned to play the harp. Everything relates to everything in life. So let's look at Proverbs 18 and 16. The Bible says, A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. So it's our gifts that can link us to associations. You may think the job you're doing is just, well, it's just a job. Think again according to the word. Psalm 37, 23 through 24, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he won't be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him in his hand. You may be running that company someday, my friend. You may, be, you may learn something from that job that makes you start a business that could ultimately really touch millions and millions of people. What we're doing here, we're crafting a spiritual resume, and everybody's got one. Start now. You should start to see some pattern in your life. You should start getting that aha moment that, wow, these are the people I like to work with, and this is the things I like to do, and this is where I'm at in my life, and... You know, this can be an aha moment for you. It really can. So you may move in direction in one life and end up in another. God may shift your covering. He did Joseph. When he went to Dothan, he arrived in Egypt. Uh, our lives can take a turn, but let it be a turn for God. Psalms 37 and 31, the law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Because if you are in God, even if you, you veer off, God's going to get you on the right track, and it's all going to work to good to them that love God according to his purpose. As long as you stay obedient to God, you'll travel on the right pathways, or you could miss the turn in the road forever. Psalm 119, 133, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. The work that you do for God will con consist of things you enjoy. God will seed it in your spirit, and you will move in that direction. It's his desire that will catapult you forward, because you're going to get so much fulfillment by accomplishing what God wants done for the kingdom. And let me say, the things you desire are the things you're good at, you're gifted at. So that makes sense that you'll move in that direction. When we please God, we're happy. And Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. Uh, it, it's all about his will. So next one, the next bullet is testing, refinement, and fruitfulness. Look at the testing of some of the people of God. Let's look at Job. He practically lost his life. He lost everything he had, and what did God do? He stayed in there. He stayed in it. He stayed in it. And what happened? God gave him twice as much. But let's see what Job's response was. In the 13th chapter of Job, verse 5, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But he added this sidebar. He said, But I will maintain my own ways before him. Well, let's look at 10 chapters later. In Job 23 and 10, he says, but he knoweth, that the, he knoweth the way I will take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You see, if you're in a refinement process, guarantee you, you're going to come forth as gold. You're going to go to a higher place. After three years, Elijah, it, he proclaimed there was going to be a drought, no rain for three years. And after a few years, he started feeling the effects of it. Has God ever given you a word and all of a sudden you get all kinds of trouble in your life? You get all kinds of trials? You bet. Finances, you know, God give you a word on your finances, your, your spirituality, your spiritual gifts, and all of a sudden you have trials. This is called the refinement process, and God will use a promise he did with Abraham. Your descendants are going to be the stars of the sea, the stars of the sky, and the sands of the sea. Years he's walking. His wife is still barren. Years he keep walking, but one day, one day. Let's look what happened to Elijah. 1 Kings 17 and 9. This is what God said to him. Arise, get thee to Zarephath. You know what Zarephath means? Refinement. Which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. God brought humility to his life through an old widow woman. Here's this big man of God, and he's got this little dinky little woman sustaining him. God knows how to refine us. He really does. Hebrews 5 and 8, Though he were a son, speaking of Jesus, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. That word suffer means to experience evil. God experienced evil. 
He, he, he was all around it, but he did not partake of it. It's going to affect us, but we are going to overcome it. We're going to get the victory by the blood of the Lamb, and we're going to move forward unto greater things after God has tested us. John 15, 2 through 5, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, and it may bring forth more fruit. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I am him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Go try to do your own thing. Some people have. Some people tuning in have. And where has it gotten you? If you do it God's way, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be happy. Great things are coming your way. Just get into the ship. Get into the ark. Stay in God. Get in God. And you're going to find your destiny. Let's look at the chastening of the Lord. That's part of the trials. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. It says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Near the be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth even as a father, the son in whom he delights. I have watched in my lifetime God would start the chastening and people would literally leave the church. And if they only knew, if you stay in the ship, if you turn to God, if you shove to God, you're going to be blessed. But God has got to purify us. He's got to get some junk on us. He wants to take us to a higher place. So let God prune us, okay? What would have happened if Peter would have said, oh, man, you know, after he denied Jesus three times, you know, I'm going to go fishing the rest of my life. He would have missed it. What if Joshua would have said, I'm not going in that promised land. There's giants. He would have missed it. What if, you know, David would have said, wow, this guy's awful big. I can't do that. He would have missed that great opportunity, that great uh, feat and exploit. What if Abraham would have stopped walking? What if Samson would have, after he was blinded, would have stopped trying to destroy the Philistines? What if... You know, Deborah would have said, well, it's too hard for us. Guys, let's pack our bags and go home. The next bullet I want to talk about is personality. Peter was always blurting out words that he shouldn't have said. He was always doing dumb things like cutting off the ear of a soldier, saying he denied Jesus, but Peter was a leader. And he had the heart after God. And he was the one that God gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven, said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. He had a pivotal place and then he got to preach the first message. And then he got to preach on how to be saved. What a greater thing. He told him, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, take Paul. The Bible said, you know, Ananias, God spoke to Ananias. He said he's a chosen vessel. You know, he's going to suffer many things. And he's, he's going to go before Gentiles, kings, and, 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 he's going to, and the children of Israel. For I am going to show him what great things he must suffer. And suffer he did. But if he didn't have that strong personality he did, he'd have never made it. He would have never conquered and, and, and won as many people to God as that, as that man did. He would never wrote over half the New Testament. It would have never happened. The next thing, and, and also God's not going to send a timid person to go kill a, kill a giant. Not going to do it. He's going to send somebody like David who's a warrior. So our personality fits into our calling as well. Think about your personality. Next, there's our associations in our environment, and that's the last thing. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Saul favored David. Saul loved David. Why do we need the favor of God? Well, people are like doors, my grandfather used to say. You know, if you're good to those doors, you've got many doors to go to. But if you're not good to those doors, they get shut. And then you have no doors to open. Because people can take you through associations with God to great places. He, people that God sets you up with, with favor of God and favor of man, can catapult you into greatness. You don't know who you're hanging out with that can help you become something great in God. Let's look at the greatest association we ever have is Jesus Christ. He said, I can, we can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth us. Jesus said in Luke 12, 48, For unto whom much soever is given... Of him shall much be required, and to whom men commit much, of him they will ask the more. So you're going to pay a price. Don't think you're going to get anything free. You better pull yourself up by the bootstraps and recognize that if you're going to be great in God, you're going to do great things, you're going to pay a price for it. But there's nothing greater in life than belonging to Jesus Christ, being a peculiar treasure for him, and doing great things for God. That's exciting. I mean, that is, to me, there's nothing like it. 
Matthew 16, 24 through 25, Jesus said, If any man will, will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will lose his life shall, shall, shall uh, basically is going to find it. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, the Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I, that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. It says, Then ye shall call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. It's, it's about seeking. It's about going after. You need to start moving forward in your local church. And if you're, you're a couch saint of God or trying to find God, you need to find a local church. Okay? Give me a call at 563-599-2980. I want, to, I want to chat with you. You need to belong to a local assembly. You need, if you want a Bible study, we'll teach you. If you want to pray, I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you daily. There's many people that have called me, and I'm praying for you every morning in my prayer closet. I want to tell you that. Many names. There's Steve and, and Joanne and, 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 and Bo and, and uh, um, Nancy, and I can go on and on some of these names that I call out to God. God cares about you. He cares that you're happy. And I don't know about you, but it's not fun living without a purpose. You've got to have a purpose. Why not get an eternal purpose? Why not, you know, learn how to teach a home Bible study? Why not go to the nursing homes and, and teach there? Why not start a, maybe it's a singles group that you're going to start. Maybe it's, it's you just want to make quilts for, for people. It, it just maybe you want to be a Sunday school teacher. Maybe you want to be a preacher. Maybe you want to teach home Bible studies or just be a teacher. Get in the Word of God. Get a prayer life. Read your Bible. Start, start pursuing God. That's where you're going to find it. It's not hard. It's really not. You just need to keep moving. The Bible says, woe unto them that take their ease in Zion. We don't have to take our ease. We can run after it. Run in hot pursuit of God. And he will fill your hands like he did Ruth in the middle of the harvest field, because that's where you're going to find it, to where the Bible says she had handfuls of purpose. Wouldn't you like to have that? Wouldn't you like to feel good that, you're, that you are doing something to birth people into the kingdom of God? There's nothing that God loves more than having more kids. There's nothing more than being fruitful for the kingdom of God. Till the next time, I just want to say, be about his business, and uh, you will be blessed. Have a great day. Give us a call at 563-599-2980. God bless you today.